start again with our Friday session. Uh, the next uh, lecturer is Daniel Segre from uh, University of Boston with uh, his uh, second lecture about uh, metabolism uh, from its genomic scales to existence. Please, Daniel. Thank you. Slides work? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone, again. Uh, so when we're going to continue talking about metabolism in microbial communities. So this is a perfect segue from the previous talk. And I just want to remind you, um, in the previous time, we were talking about the logic of the cell, the me metabolism as a resource allocation problem. Um, and just to remind you brief briefly, um, the idea was to look at the complete metabolic network in an organism with knowledge of the nutrients that are coming in, the biomass components that are needed to produce a new cell and new biomass. And we uh, introduced flux balance analysis where there are constraints on the concentration of each metabolite not changing in time, so steady state constraint. There were assumptions of capacity limits for the nutrients that are coming in and for some reactions that might be known to be irreversible. And we showed that one can use optimization, for example, finding the, op the, the state that is optimal for the cell to efficiently produce its biomass um, through max maximization of the growth rate. And in general, one can actually write this uh, problem in the following way, uh, where there is a, a steady state is expressed as this uh, relationship between the vector of the fluxes multiplied by the stoichiometric matrix we saw last time. And there are general capacity constraints. In general, one can put upper and lower bound to each flux uh, and optimize any linear combination of the fluxes uh, using linear programming. We also showed the um, geometrical interpretation of this where there's a feasible space and we're really looking for uh, an edge and uh, vertex in this polyhedral cone, this um, convex structure that will represent the point that maximizes our objective function. Now, we want to dive straight into how we can apply this to the study of microbial consortia. And I will first show um, why metabolism really matters for microbial consortia. You saw some examples uh, already, but I want to walk you through the way we and others started thinking about this from the perspective of the complete knowledge of the metabolic capability of organisms. And one slide I always like to show about this is the following. So this is one of few instances, I think, where a lot of the interaction between different microbes are uh, well characterized. So this is a picture from a review by Colin Brander and colleagues showing different shapes. These are different microbes that colonize, in this case, um, the human teeth. So this is part of the human oral microbiome. Um, and what is stunning about this image is that really a lot of these links are known metabolic interactions between microbes. Some of these are the early colonizers, and then there is this uh, growing community um, that is uh, we try to get rid of uh, by brushing our teeth. And what is known about this interaction, some of these are uh, known as contact interaction between different species. Um, and what is known also is that some of these interactions are related to metabolic exchange. And as you heard before, um, this is probably a very common way in which microbes can cooperate with each other or exchange with each other material in many different ways. In this case, for example, a known pathogen, Porphyromonas gingivalis, can exchange different metabolites with another microbe in this biofilm. So this was, um, you know, this is interesting. The question is how common are these interactions between microbes based on metabolic exchange? Can we model them using flux balance modeling and so on? And I'll show you first how we um, early on tested this idea that metabolism really plays a role in the formation of biofilms and microbial communities using exactly this uh, known structure of the biofilm. Um, this was an idea from a former student in my lab, Varun Mazumdar, um, who took this map and asked the following question. So you can imagine having, looking, uh, we, we knew the genomes of uh, all of these microbes. These were well-characterized microbial strains. So we could look at each of these strains 
and their in, intracellular internal uh, capabilities in terms of what metabolic functions they had. And at this stage, we weren't ready to do yet uh, genome scale modeling, this flux balance analysis for each of these organisms, but we took a much simpler approach, which as I'll show you soon, uh, will, was uh, nevertheless quite, quite insightful. Um, and the idea was the following, for each pair of microbes, we could ask, we could compute a metabolic distance. So this is a pairwise, pairwise metabolic distance, just based on the profiles of which reactions each organism contained. So for example, if you have two organisms here, A and B, um, uh, you know, simple uh, version of this reaction vector, reaction content vector. Uh, so for example, organism A contains reaction one and reaction four, organism B contains reaction three and four. And based on these strings that are just binary strings, which you can uh, obtain from the annotated genomes of these organisms, you can compute a distance. We computed a Jacquard distance um, to, to quantify how different metabolically these two organisms are. And of course, you can do this for any pair of organisms and you'll have this matrix of um, similarity or dissimilarity based on the metabolic capabilities of these organisms. Um, so what was done then was to compute the average metabolic distance for different kinds of paths through this community. So you can imagine taking paths that are we called order preserving. So paths that only go upwards in the biofilm in what is known to be uh, the layer structure of the biofilm from the early colonizer to the late colonizer. So this would be an order preserving path because it only goes upwards. And of course, there are many other random paths that do not preserve the order of colonization that can jump up and down um, between different species in the biofilm. So in doing so, we could then compute the average distance uh, between all pairs of organisms in both the random paths and the order preserving paths. And what we observed was that there was a clear difference between the distribution of metabolic, of average metabolic distances between the order preserving paths and the random paths. And in particular, the order preserving paths had a pairwise, average pairwise distance between subsequent organisms that was significantly smaller than the average pairwise metabolic distance for any possible random uh, non-order preserving path. Um, so this was an interesting indication that somehow if you look at the correct order of colonization, there is something unique about the species-species similarity in terms of metabolic functions. And um, as you may imagine, one possible interpretation of this is that organisms that are um, metabolically more similar to each other will have metabolites to share and will be able to gradually connect to each other metabolically building this uh, biofilm. Now, um, this somehow is a, or was an early indication that metabolism matters in microbial communities, and in particular, in this case, in the order of colonization of the biofilm. Um, we observed, by the way, that if you look at the same um, uh, property of in pairwise average distance for non-metabolic genes, you don't see this clear distinction between the two distributions. Um, and of course, there are different possible interpretation of what, what was found, right? This could reflect really the fact that organisms build on top of each other, but could also reflect, at least partially, an environmental gradient. For example, maybe there is a more anaerobic environment at the bottom of the biofilm and increasingly aerobic as, you, uh, as the biofilm grows. And in that case, perhaps the similarity and dissimilarity reflects uh, adaptation to this gradient. Uh, but there was something else that came out of this, which uh, I felt was quite interesting. This kind of paradox, if you take this idea that metabolically similar organisms will tend to uh, stay close to each other and build the biofilm, um, what would prevent this to collapse into a you know, absolutely minimal distance boredom where all the organisms are really uh, clustering in, in a structure by, uh, by their similarity? And of course, uh, in that situation, competition might dominate the capacity to exchange metabolites through synergy. Um, but it raises this interesting question of whether there is an optimal metabolic distance for metabolic synergy between a uh, complete difference between two metabolic networks and complete similarity. And I don't, I don't think this is a resolved problem. Uh, I think there are interesting papers coming out recently on this question. I want to show you 
how we start addressing this early on by using a concept that is uh, called elementary flux modes. And I don't have time and wanna go into all the details of that, but I'll just mention what is essential here, which is this elementary flux modes are a way of um, enumerating all the possible pathways in a metabolic network, all the possible minimal unique pathways in a metabolic network. Um, and you can take an organism um, and um, duplicate it and ask the following question. If I put two organisms together and just count the number of pathways that are possible when I have these two organisms together uh, relative to the elementary modes that are present in organism one plus the number of elementary modes, the number of these pathways that are present in organism two. And if the two organisms are completely non-overlapping and you can build artificial metabolic network to um, engineer to have an arbitrary degree of overlap between these two networks. So if these two networks have zero overlap, then if you com uh, compute this quantity, the uh, number of pathways of the system altogether divided by the sum of each of the two individually, um, then of course the sum of the pathway is exactly the, um, the sum of the pathways present in each organism, and this quantity is one. And at the opposite extreme, if you take two organisms that are exactly the same, have exactly the same metabolic capabilities, uh, when you compute this quantity, each organism, the two organisms are the same. So the uh, elementary modes of the uh, junction between these two organisms is really the same of each organism alone. And this quantity will have a value of a half. And what is interesting, and you cannot really uh, quantify this unless you actually do the calculations and we did these calculations, you can find that there is, and uh, this is uh, almost like an uh, um, um, analysis theorem, right? There, there is a maximum here uh, as one might expect, but it's interesting that you can find this sweet spot of how much metabolic overlap will lead to the maximal number of new metabolic pathways that are embedded in this combined systems, uh, system of organs one, organism two. So this is just based on the topology. It's a very simplistic calculation, but it points to the possibility that there may be out there some um, a sweet spot or a, um, some kind of uh, ideal level of metabolic similarity that will lead to maximal enhancement of metabolic capabilities. And of course, this doesn't take into account uh, competition. It's just about how much a new metabolism can be done by bringing two organisms together. And as I mentioned last time, I'm, I'm gonna pause occasionally, but feel free to interrupt. And if I'm not monitoring the chat, but there is a question, just someone please stop me and I'm happy to uh, pause and, and address any question. So from this early, very um, simple um, presence absence analysis, we really wanna move to a stage where we can model computationally the dynamics of communities. And as we saw in, in multiple talks, including the previous one, one can look at uh, a community as, as a set of entities, right? Can, that can represent it between, you know, in different, uh, different, different levels of description, this would represent maybe more like a lot of Volterra model where you have uh, individual variables representing individual organisms and you can try and model the community as um, an ecological system in this way, um, there is the possibility, which is really what flux balance can do and what we'll focus on, where you can think of uh, the circuits within each organism and try to predict the interactions between different species based on what you know about the intracellular circuits of each organism. And as we'll discuss probably uh, next time, there is also the possibility of thinking, but I want to hint to this, this now, there is the possibility of thinking of a community as a soup of enzymes, where perhaps uh, for a complex community, what really matters is what functions are present overall in the community. And we can ask the question of whether or not compartmentalization matters. So is it important to know which functions are performed by which organism, or is it possible and useful to think of a community as this overall conglomerate of metabolic functions. So for now, we will focus on this um, type of modeling where we really uh, know the intracellular wiring, we know the environment, and we try to predict ecological interactions and the dynamics and the structure of the community. And we'll also talk a little bit about design of the community. And I see there is something in the chat. I don't know if it's a question. Yeah, do you wanna ask this question? 
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Daniel. So I, I, I type in the box. So, so my question is that for the first example of the order of the colonization in the bowel film, so I, I saw the result is that the, the bacteria in the ordered path has smaller metabolic di distance. So my question is that does that mean that, uh, you know, if, if there are two types of uh, the effects, which is one is the environmental gradient, another one is the ecological interaction, could, could change the dynamics. So would that result mean that the uh, environmental gradients dominate over the ecological interactions? Uh, because in, in my mind, you know, maybe I'm wrong, I just think that uh, if the ecological interactions are more importantly to, you know, preserve the order, um, then there might be a lot of cross fittings between the metabolically more di different bacteria uh, that might be prevalent, which is not the case in your data. So I just want some, some comments on, on that question. Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. Very nice. yeah. that's a very interesting question. And I guess I, I think from this early analysis, we don't, don't really have enough information to, to determine this. What I thought was interesting here is that if you practically look at what organisms, what, like the evidence we found there was that if you look at the organisms that are close to each other in the biofield, there seems to be a tendency toward a smaller metabolic distance. And I agree that we don't really have enough information to, you know, to know whether to interpret this as, okay, there is a just driving force that is the gradient of uh, environmental oxygen or nutrients and so on. But there could be also a situation where each organism right, modifies the environment for the next organism to occur. And, and then the question is, and the possibility, and what I, what I think might be happening is that uh, organisms that are too different from each other, they may not have enough um, cross-feeding opportunities. And, and of course, if organisms are too close, they will compete, but there may be some sweet, sweet spot in between. And we can get back to this. I think uh, the answer to this will really come from looking at the more advanced dynamical models we'll, we'll reach uh, analyze soon. But I'm happy to go back to this question, which I think is very interesting. So, um, so we, we want to move to, to these dynamical models. And I, I want to show you how um, there was a different direction early on. And now there is an explosion of different experiments of this kind. But this is uh, really these early days of trying to think of synthetic cooperation. And now the idea of building synthetic microbial communities as a way of testing hypothesis and checking what is really happening when you put the organisms together, can microbes cross feed and so on and so forth. And there was these early attempts that were, were um, really interesting and a motivation for a lot of the things we uh, did later on. So this was a paper from um, Winin Shu and collaborators uh, in 2007. And this was an engineered cooperation between two yeast strains, one of which uh, could not produce uh, adenine and the other could not produce lysine. And the idea was that only when grown together, they could really uh, would be able to survive. And in fact, this was indeed the case. So this was an engineered cross-feeding interaction that made each of these two strains uh, completely dependent on the other. It turns out, and uh, Wenin has continued working on this, doing beautiful work, showing, for example, that it's not clear um, that the metabolites that you would expect being exchanged to this, the terminal portions of, um, of these pathways are the one being exchanged. And there is a lot of interesting aspects of these dynamics and uh, I mentioned more in, uh, later on. The other example um, more focused on uh, just trying to find different types of interactions as opposed to engineering them. This was done with E. coli strains, a library of mutants, and the idea was to put these um, mutants together. First, I mean, if you grow them individually, they grow fine in rich medium. Uh, individually, they would grow very poorly in minimal media because they're mutants that lack the capacity to synthesize. Uh, I think these are only um, amino acids. Uh, but occasionally, when you put them together, you could see synergistic growth. So this was a way of uh, trying to detect new interactions. And there were a number of new interactions that were detected. This was work by Ed Wintermute and Pam Silver. So, when we started thinking about this, we thought it would be interesting to um, try and mimic some of these ideas using uh, stoichiometric models. This is work that a former student in my lab, Niels Klipkert, pioneered. And we tried to do things in a slightly different way. So rather than tweaking the internal circuits of the cell, as done in these previous examples, right, you can do mutations and try to do, induce interactions based on uh, 
changes in the circuits, in, in particular oxotrophies or um, removal of genes that are essential for producing essential compounds, we thought that perhaps it would be interesting to tweak the environment. And so take two organisms that are natural occurring microbial strains and ask whether we can induce an interactions not by changing the, the circuits inside, but changing the environment. And the idea was that, well, first of all, this is in, you know, simpler to test potentially, because if you want to test, uh, in particular, a high throughput um, interactions of this kind, it's much simpler to just provide different nutrients experimentally than having to uh, do mutations uh, to the strains. And the other aspects of this, which turned out to be really um, the, the beginning of a new line of research, is that, uh, and a lot of people are obviously interested in this, the environment clearly have a, has a strong effect on modulating interactions. So this is a way of starting to look at how the environment can uh, really, you know, can the environment, environmental changes induce interactions and what is the role and how much variability there is in these interactions as a function of uh, environmental composition. You can change in principle the carbon, the nitrogen, the sulfur, phosphorus source and so on. So there is an endless combinations of different nutrients that can be used to try and um, induce these interactions. Of course, one could use a rational approach and we'll see more of this. But for now, what we did was just simply use flux balance modeling to try and find in a large space of possible compounds, some that would induce interactions. And I need to tell you a little bit more about how this is done in practice because it's non-trivial, right? When you look at this, we saw how to model an individual organism, but how do you know, how do you go from a stoichiometric model of an individual organism to a stoichiometric model of a community where you have two organisms together. And the answer in the end is really something that existed already in the flux balance world, uh, but was, was used for different purposes. And the idea is to use compartments. So you can build a compartmentalized model and I'll illustrate this with this very simple example where you have two organisms, um, one and two, and they have a very minimal network. Organism one, can produce B from A, organism two can produce C from A, but each of them has a biomass that depends on A, B, and C. So each of them needs all, all of these three compounds to survive. And if A is the only compound provided in the environment, the only possibility for these two organisms to survive is to exchange B and C. So this is a you know, minimal example of cross-feeding if you wish, but it's all, it also illustrates how you can build a model of a community using stoichiometry and flux balance modeling. And the idea is that you can define, you'll have multiple versions of each metabolite. So you'll have an environmental metabolite A and you'll have an environmental, uh, sorry, a metabolite A that is in organism one, you can label it as A1. And you'll have a metabolite A that is in organism two, you can label it as A2 and so on and so forth. And you can write the system of re reactions just labeling the organism, the metabolites based on which organism they occur in. And, and you'll have essentially, essentially a block diagonal matrix representing this uh, system of two, two species interacting. Okay? So this is, um, you know, in a very superficial way, the, the, you know, the, the way this stoichiometric model for communities can be built based on this multi-compartment model. This was first proposed by uh, Stoller and um, David Stahl in a, in a very nice molecular systems biology paper in 2007. So we took this approach and used it to scan systematically, systematically the space of possible environmental metabolites. Um, and just to illustrate briefly the way this algorithm was designed, you can first take two organisms and ask under what conditions can these two organisms grow both at a growth rate that is above a minimal threshold. And you can search all the possible carbon sources you have, all the possible nitrogen sources, and you can do the same for other elemental sources, but you'll have, if you find the, those that provide growth to the pair of organisms together, you'll have a set of putative media that support growth of the whole ecosystem. Um, and now what is interesting, once you take this media, you can ask for each of them um, whether it also supports growth of each organism on its own. And all of this, again, to remind you, you do, uh, you can do easily using flux balance analysis. So you have, by definition, right, we've had uh, many, many different environments, all these different combination of carbon and nitrogens that all support growth 
of species one and two together in this joint stoichiometric model. But then you can take a given environment and ask, will it, that environment also support growth of organism one alone and organism two alone? And if that, the, the answer is yes, then you found an environment right, that supports the pair together, but supports also each individual organism. And this is a case where the organs are not really interacting. They can grow on their own. They can grow together. Nothing interesting about it. But you can start finding then environments where, for example, the two can grow together. That's, again, how these were originally found. Organism one can grow, but organism two cannot grow. And then what this means is that the two organisms grow together, uh, but two cannot grow by itself. This means that one must be providing an essential compound to organism two. Uh, same situation here. So if you find environments that satisfy these conditions, these would be environments that would support a commensal uh, interaction where one organism depend on the other. And if none of the two organisms can grow on its own, then um, again, because the pair by definition was growing, then what you find is a set of conditions that imposes, induces a mutualistic uh, two-way cross-feeding interaction between the two species. So what is nice is that you can easily make this list of many, many environments. And for each of them, you can test whether uh, which of these is the case and ask how many times will you find environments that induce, for example, these mutualistic interactions. And I should say, when we started doing this, we really didn't know what to expect. How often would this happen? And the idea was to start getting an idea of how frequent, how prevalent, how large is the space of this possible cross-feeding interactions in metabolism. And what Niels found was actually, okay. oh, yes. Okay, sorry, just a quick question. Maybe I missed this, but in the joint FBA, what's the objective function? Is it the oh. sum of both? Uh, of Great both question. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for asking. Yeah, so there are different flavor flavors of this joint FBA um, in this early. So I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get back to this because that's actually this very question motivated a lot of other things uh, I'm gonna talk about. But um, compartment models, you have to choose an objective function. And the very first case was based on maximizing a linear combination of the two biomasses. So you can create a new reaction that uh, builds a linear combination of these two biomasses with a fixed proportion, but then you determine in advance, right? What is the proportion of the two species? Uh, you can do this by scanning many different proportions and seeing which one seems to be most uh, um, growing faster. Um, but it's it's a little bit tricky. So you can see already that this question of what is the objective function of a community turns out to be a really interesting question, but also a tricky one. And if you choose an objective function for these uh, communities, um, you know, you it, this is a little bit like testing a hypothesis. What we did in this case, because all, uh, well, all we wanted to know is whether we could find an environment that supports growth of each organism. So what all we did was, um, in this case, as, ask that the growth rate of each organism has to be above a certain threshold. So we asked that each of them grows at least a certain amount. Um, doesn't matter, um, you know, they don't have to grow optimally, they have to grow above a certain threshold. And then what we did, we used mixed integer linear programming to minimize the number of exchange reactions. So we asked what is, um, the minimal way for these two organisms to potentially exchange something so that they can go grow both above a certain threshold, which is why if the minimum number is zero, that's totally fine. Maybe the two organisms grow together uh, without you know, having to exchange anything. And in these cases, there will be a non-zero number of exchange reaction. But thanks for asking these questions because I forgot to mention this. So that's, uh, okay. does this clarify? Yeah. Yes, 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 thanks. Okay, great. So. Um, so let's go back to the results here, which again were um, quite interesting. And this exemplifies some of what we found. So these are seven species for which we run all these pairwise interactions. And um, there is organism one and organism two here, uh, but you know, these are the same organisms. You can look, for example, at the interaction between E. coli and Salmonella. And what you see in this pie chart, the the overall size of the chart pie chart represents the number of media of different combination of nutrients that we found uh, that could support the two organisms together. So for example, if you look at E. coli and Salmonella, there are uh, millions of different nutrient combinations that can support growth of the pair. 
whereas, for example, E. coli and H. pylori um, have a very small number of sets of nutrients that can support both of them together. And then out of all these possible nutrients, you can look how many of these are of this neutral kind, that is uh, environments that support also growth of each organism on its own. And Salmonella and E. coli is very, are very similar in their metabolic capability. So as expected, you find a large proportion, uh, this green portion of the pie chart of nutrients, nutrient combination media that are um, essentially good minimal media, both for E. coli and Salmonella. And of course they support growth of them together, but there is nothing interesting about this. But there was also a lot of um, interactions that are um, commensal of one organism providing something for the other organism. And what was most stunning, and we really didn't expect that there are a lot of opportunities for this cross-feeding. All the yellow portions in this pie chart are cases where really this would be environments such that uh, if you feed those nutrients to those two species, they really need each other in order to survive. And I should say that this is only based on stoichiometry, right? If we were to do exactly these experiments in the lab, I wouldn't expect all of these interactions to occur because the fact that the stoichiometry have this property doesn't mean necessarily that the organism will have the right regulatory program to express the right genes to induce that interaction and so on. So this is a purely theoretical flux balance stoichiometry based um, diagram. But what it illustrates, right, is that there is out there in the microbial world, there are millions of opportunities for cross-feeding and that they're strongly dependent on the environments in which the organisms grow. And also illustrates that in principle, if you learn how to manage these uh, possibilities, there could be a lot of opportunities for engineering communities where you, by designing the environment, you could decide whether or not two organisms will depend on each other. So this was promising, but as I was hinting to, and uh, you know, the question uh, asked was hinting to, uh, there are some um, underlying assumptions in this type of model that are, uh, that are somehow tricky and will, uh, so in particular, right, the require assumption on um, this ecosystem level objective of what, you know, how do you manage these two biomasses? How do you, you know, there, there, there is some interesting hypothesis on the possibility that maybe you could use thermodynamic based objective functions. So I think this is a fascinating question, um, but there are other limitations of this approach. For example, in the same way as flux balance will not allow you to predict intracellular metabolite concentrations, because those are factor out when you assume the steady state. For similar reasons, with uh, this type of um, compartmentalized based approaches, you cannot predict the amount of each um, species in the community, which is often one of the main, main things you would like to be able to know. Uh, so you cannot predict how much there is of each species at steady state. And this is a major limitation of this approach. Another limitation is that it's very difficult to do spatial temporal dynamics. You cannot really do um, dynamical models based on this because it's all uh, steady state approximations and you can just compute one steady state. And as we'll see later, the solution to this is gonna be what is called dynamic FBA or DFBA, which is an extension of flux balance analysis, which will simultaneously solve a lot of these issues and I think open up a lot of uh, new opportunities. Now, before we go there, I wanna um, uh, pause for a second and think about this question of why would microbes exchange metabolites, right? And there are many different angles for this and we'll see this from different perspectives and this came up and will come up again, I'm sure in other talks, but um, you know, metabolites are part of this uh, strategy that microbes develop to you know, grow and produce their own biomass. Why should they give out metabolites to someone else? Um, and as we saw last time, right, there are some pathways such as ferment fermentative pathways that inherently give rise to secretions. And these secretions might be helpful to other organisms, but it's not clear how prevalent these secretions are and whether indeed um, these secretions are typically, um, a, you know, something that would be very costly for microbes to produce and then give rise to questions about uh, stability, cheaters, and, and so on. And, and we'll kind of get more into this. So, so um, one way we started thinking about this um, was first by quantifying really the cost of metabolic secretions. And this is work um, by a graduate student in the lab, Alan Pacheco. Um, and the first observation we made that motivated this, this was initiated by Niels Klitko before it was, um, 
asking the following question. If you take a flux balance model, say for E. coli, and you can grow it on different combination of nutrients and ask the following question. If you impose a secretion flux, will you induce a reduction in growth rate? So how much, uh, how much will you have to pay in terms of the growth rate if you impose that that organism secretes a certain metabolite? And as you might expect, right, there are secretions, in this case, succinate, such that if you ask the cell, you know, before maximizing growth, you say, okay, there has to be this amount of flux of succinate going out of the cell, and then you maximize growth, and the growth rate you obtain, in this case, for example, on glucose, glucose and, and glycerol as carbon sources, the growth rate you'll obtain is significantly smaller than the maximal growth rate when you don't impose a secretion flux. So this would be a case of a metabolite that is costly. And um, kind of corroborating what we we're saying earlier, whether or not metabolite secretion is costly depends strongly on what are the nutrients. So on a different set of nutrients, succinate production is not, not very costly until you produce a lot of it. But then what is interesting, and let's look at this first actually, because that's an example we already illustrated before, there are metabolites um, such as acetate, if you're growing under uh, carbon, uh, sorry, oxygen limited conditions, this is something that will spontaneously happen. And in fact, um, if you impose a secretion flux of uh, acetate that is small or zero, uh, right, the cell will not be able to grow optimally. And in fact, it will grow better when you impose that there is a high secretion of acetate possible. Okay? So in this case, the secretion is actually beneficial. And there are some, some cases in between um, such as formate, where apparently for the two environments explored here, secretion doesn't change, uh, the objective function doesn't change the growth rate. So these are kind of neutral uh, secretions. Um, so we, we will call both, you know, these two kinds of secretions uh, for the purpose of this talk, we'll call them costless. That is metabolic secretions that do not impose a cost or at least a reduction in the growth rate under this assumption. And I want to remind you, this is particularly relevant since we just heard about uh, the cost of protein production and the capacity of embedding into flux balance model the, um, the or consumer resource model that is also possible in flux balance models, the cost of protein production. So this doesn't include any of that. Uh, uh, this was done with regular flux balance models, but one could uh, extend this kind of approach to models that also include protein production and the cost of protein production. So let me show you what we found. So what Alan did, he wanted to uh, I find how frequent are these costly, costless secretions in the microbial world. And again, the idea was to scan many different flux balance models, looking for uh, how often would we found would we find costless secretions. Um, so Alan designed the following experiment. The idea was to have an, enough variability of environments to explore systematically a large space. Uh, so again, this was done only in silico. Um, and I'll mention later, there is a follow-up work that is being done, uh, done experimentally now on this. But the idea here was to give two different carbon sources chosen out of a pool of different carbons and also choose whether or not to provide oxygen. So we could do this in silico experiments aerobically or anaerobically. And as hinted to before, of course, this can have a big consequence on whether or not there are secretions or what secretions being produced. And then we computed the possible, the maximal growth rate of two organisms, of a pair of chosen organisms under these conditions. And what we did was uh, estimate if the, any of the organisms could grow, what metabolite could be secreted in a costless way. So we asked, is there any metabolite that upon maximizing growth, each of these organisms could produce? And now we did iterations where these costless metabolites was added to the medium, or added to the medium, and we repeated the experiment growing the same organism, but now on the original medium plus the costlessly produced metabolites. So this, the idea of this analysis was that we could get insight both into what costless metabolites could be produced, but also whether these costless metabolites were really useful for facilitating growth of a second organism. Um, so we did this for um, these two different conditions of oxygen availability, 108 carbon sources, 14 different species for a total of over a million unique simulations. And I'm not going to show all the details. Uh, there is a lot of data that came out of this that is available in this Nature Communications paper. Uh, but I just, just want to illustrate uh, 
uh, what you know uh, summarize what we found, which is that there are many different type of secretions, uh, no much more than what uh, we originally thought, and not just the organic acid. The organic acids are this light brown portion, so there is a large portion of organic acids, but there are a lot of other molecules, carbohydrates, some inorganic compounds. The metals are not necessarily so interesting because they're just coming in and out of the models, uh, but there are some peptides, some phosphate that are being exchanged. And for an overall total of about 60 metabolites and a little bit more when you have no oxygen. And as expected, somehow there is a little bit uh, larger number of secretions uh, when oxygen is unavailable, which is interesting in itself. And, and again, it's interesting to think of this in terms of ecological niches and whether really uh, you know, that's something that would be testable, whether indeed there is a, a prevalence or a, additional metabolic interactions in anaerobic conditions. And the other thing that was interesting is that these secretions could really induce interactions across different species. So uh, for example, out of all the different species, if you focus first, or for example, the oxygen dependent one, you can count how many sim in how many simulations both organisms could initially grow. And there is a certain number. Um, and there is, this is what is interesting. This is the number of uh, combinations of microbes and environments where growth could occur after cross-feeding. So after at least one round of costlessly produced metabolites being fed back into the medium. So there is a large increase in the possible growth capabilities induced by this um, uh, costless production. And these are the proportions of which either zero or one of the two organisms grow. So the interesting part is that you can almost double the, the number of combination of nutrients in an organism in which there is growth of a pairs of organisms because of this cross feeding interaction. So again, this was based only on flux balance modeling, based only on stoichiometry, but it's a, it's a different illustration and points out the fact that uh, in this case, right, the cross feeding can be induced by metabolites that are really not inducing, not causing a decrease in the growth rate of each individual organism. And the idea that, right, you know, we're, we're there's a lot of interesting work and, and I'm sure there is many cases in which interactions are due to metabolites that are costly. And this could be evolved traits and we're gonna talk about this soon, but it could be evolved traits where an organism produces a, a metabolite that is costly because it leads to an advantageous interaction. But there is um, the idea that is emerging from this analysis that there are a lot of opportunities out there for costless interactions, things that are induced just by organisms doing what is best for themselves. And at the same time in doing so, uh, throwing out there something that someone else has, can use. Uh, I view this as a little bit like as recycling, right? In social community, social, um, you know, human societies, you know, there are things, you know, when you are finished with, with your milk, you know, you throw away the bottle and if you can actually uh, recycle it instead, it doesn't cost anything to you. Uh, but it actually can be valuable for someone else. And the, the idea is that this kind of interaction may be very abundant in the microbial world. And I, um, this is a map of the specific metabolites that can be exchanged. I'm not gonna uh, go into the details uh, into this, but if anybody's interested, you can actually look at what specific metabolites are being secreted under what conditions. And there is a lot of interesting follow-up analysis one can do on this. But I wanna summarize this just by showing that the emerging uh, network that we, you know, we, we looked at by analyzing this costless interaction. So this is a network of what organism could feed which other organism in this set of organisms we analyzed based on costless secretions. And the picture that emerged here is that there is a dense network of possible uh, interactions that emerge spontaneously between different species that uh, may not require organisms to give up anything, uh, anything valuable, but are just emergent property of the system. And somehow this was similar to the result that in parallel, Alvaro Sanchez, and, and you'll hear about this, um, uh, found in this, uh, organ in this community um, uh, grown from um, simple carbon sources uh, from plants and uh, soil. And, and this is one of the illustrations from that work, which you'll hear, I'm sure, more. But what is interesting, is, again, the, the same picture emerged that on each organism could grow on the spent medium of each other organism, uh, somehow suggesting, again, that there, there is really, there are a lot of dense 
networks of exchange out there. And, and this is somehow, I, sh I must admit, very different from what I was expecting initially. Uh, that is that it's not necessarily individual targeted interaction, but there is probably a dense network of possibilities. Now, um, and as we start thinking about this with these models, um, yeah, I, I think I have, yeah, uh, 15 more minutes. Um, as we, we start thinking of whether, in addition to looking at the natural interactions in uh, communities, we could use flux balance models to also purposefully design uh, cross-feeding interaction between species. Um, and the idea was that, you know, when, when we look at these natural interactions uh, through stoichiometry, we really look at many different organisms, many environments, and, and we look at what are the possible outcomes, but we wanted to do this in a more targeted way and also potentially get insight into what, what I like to think of as deep symbiosis, where the exchange metabolites are not necessarily uh, byproducts and of uh, you know, end results of byproducts of uh, specific pathways such as amino acids, but more convoluted interactions that you may not be able to look at or find uh, intuitively, such as exchange of two amino acids again. So let me show you. You'll see in a second what I mean. So the idea, and this is uh, sorry, work by Megan Thomas, uh, another former student in the lab with the Yanis Pascalidis and others. Um, and the idea here was the following. We took E. coli, and you can ask the following question. The, um, you have a certain number of reactions in E. coli, about 1,000, but you can force E. coli to use a smaller number of either internal reactions or exchange reactions. So imagine uh, the way I think about this is, is you have a knob. You can say, OK, instead of using 1,000 internal reactions, now you're allowed to only, only use 900. And you can ask, how well can you do? Uh, and you can tweak also the number of exchange reaction, how many metabolites you can transport from the external environment. And at some point you can imagine, let's say focus on the internal reaction. If you uh, turn this knob too much to the left, right, you, you decrease the number of possible reactions too much. At some point, the organism will not be able to grow. You might see at some point a decreasing growth if you limit the number of reactions. And at some point, there is no way for the organism to grow. But then um, one can ask, the same question for a pair of organisms. So you can start with two E. coli that are initially exactly the same. And you can impose these constraints on the internal reactions on both of these. But now each of them could choose a different set of reactions to use. And now you say, OK, I limit to, let's say, 7% of the original number of reactions they can use. But now this um, you know, top organism could choose one set of reactions. These other organisms could choose another set of reactions. And what we were wondering was whether we could find a constraint that would not allow an individual organism to grow, but would make it possible for the pair of organisms to grow together, again, in an obligate synergistic cross-feeding interaction that would be now induced by our arbitrarily tuning the number of possible reactions. And again, this was done using classical FBA in this multi-compartment model. And I'll show you a couple of outcomes of this analysis. This was done using um, mixed integer programming, linear programming, where in addition to the variables representing each flux, we had Boolean variables representing whether or not each um, reaction is present in each of the two organisms. And, and I'm not going to go into the detail of the, of the optimization. It wasn't uh, completely trivial, and it gets pretty um, time consuming as you go to full genome scale models. Uh, so it's, it, there is, I think, interesting computational work to be done in terms of trying to improve this uh, kind of algorithms. But let me show you first the outcome that we got from looking at the core metabolism of E. coli. So this is a simplified model of E. coli metabolism. And what was fascinating is that one of the solutions that the algorithm found was these two E. coli, I would say, subspecies, right? So these are species that are uh, limited in their capabilities. And you may recall here, this is glycolysis. This is the TCA cycle. But here, each of the two, two organisms uses a different half of the TCA cycle. This species uses one half. This other species using this, uses this other portion. And they exchange with each other multiple um, metabolites, including pyruvate here, but also some of the byproducts of this, you know, this intermediate byproducts of the TCA cycle. And what is interesting here is, you know, there's, there are a few things. One is um, that it would have been very difficult to come up with uh, such a scheme for a possible uh, cross-feeding without the algorithm. This is, again, not the exchange of 
two amino acids. This is uh, what again are called deep symbiosis, where two organs exchange interest, uh, uh, metabolites that are uh, are known to be uh, transportable, but are part really, really of central carbon metabolism. And there are multiple exchanges that are required for this to happen. Uh, the other part that is interesting is that in nature there are indeed organisms that do half of the TCA cycle, the incomplete TCA cycle, as we hinted to, um, some of these are related to the uh, cap capabilities of producing amino acid through these uh, reactions. But it's quite interesting that one of the solutions of this algorithm really resembles some of these half TCA cycle strategies that are found uh, in some marine bacteria. Now, when you go to uh, genome scale models, this is much more complicated and it's really impossible to visualize the whole network. So this is another way of, way of visualizing what happens. So what you see here, again, is the number of exchange reaction, the, the limit on the exchange reaction, then the limit on intracellular reactions. So you can imagine, right, you start from, this is where you have in this corner, top right, all the reactions are possible. And you gradually can decrease the number of allowed exchange reactions or internal reactions. And these uh, uh, areas, shaded areas in green and blue, represent the feasibility and the growth rate that is possible um, as you do this. And as you can see, if you start with one organism, right, one organism is feasible in this region. So what this means is that right, if you decrease the number of reactions to below about 250, one E. coli cannot grow anymore on its own. Uh, same if you decrease uh, through this it seems like a Pareto frontier, this exchange reaction, uh, if you decrease them too much, the single organism cannot grow. But this is where you can see again what we we're hinting to before, that if you have two organisms and each of, the, each of them has these limitations, then there is a much larger space wherein the two organisms can grow if they grow together and they exchange metabolites, even under constraints uh, below this 250 thresholds, up to 210 or so, or so where uh, yeah, individual organisms would not be able to grow, but the two organisms can grow together. And then there is a lot of data. Again, uh, imagine for each of these cases, you have this uh, genome scale models of the E. coli networks, and you can look at what is the structure of these networks, what metabolites are exchange exchanged, and so on. And this is just to exemplify the kind of insight you can get. You can see that there are regions in this space, as shown here, where acetate is one of the key uh, exchange metabolites, which is not surprising. Again, acetate comes back again, but there are regions when you go to the extreme, uh, you know, you push this pair of organs to the limit, then it turns out succinate, uh, again, one of the TCA cycle intermediate uh, is one of the metabolites you would exchange, you expect to be exchanged in order for these two organs to coexist. And there are areas where some um, amino acids need to be exchanged. So probably the two organisms will do, will perform complementary metabolic functions and exchange amino acids. Uh, and again, there is much more. One thing that I, you can't really see here, but I just wanna um, highlight is that there is an interesting, very thin layer here between the one organism and the two organism uh, regions where one organism is still possible and two organisms of course are possible but uh, there is a, an area here where the two organisms growth rate is faster than the one organism, single organism growth rate under those conditions. So what this would imply is that if you were to put a um, chemostat uh, experiment and force this organism to grow at a certain rate, there would be a situation where the two organisms would outcompete the single organisms, hinting to the possibility right, that this could be a transition where even if a single organism could grow on its own, but cross-feeding could be evolutionarily advantageous and, and give an advantage to a pair of synergistic organisms. It's, you know, this is uh, not, not saying anything about the details of how this could happen in real life, but it's showing that in principle, there is this um, overlap that would give an advantage to the two organism solution rather than the single organism solution. Okay, we have uh, five more minutes and I will um, tell you a little more about another aspect of this genome scale model. So, uh, right, we dealt so, so far only with organisms that are very well characterized, um, you know, well-built models such as E. coli, other organisms for which we had very good models. But um, 
as we hinted to, right, we want to start understanding complex microbiomes or more complex microbial communities. And one of the limitations that we have to be aware of is that in many of these cases, the uh, knowledge about the metabolic capabilities of these organisms is much more limited than what we have for E. coli or yeast and so on. So the question is, can we get around some of these limitations? And um, David Burns and another former student in the lab did some really nice analysis using uh, what we call metabolic percolation in order to address this question. And this, I think, is a really interesting area because um, if you think about this, when you have a metabolic network that is not working, if you do flux balance analysis and you cannot produce a certain amino acid, the network will just not grow and will, will give you zero information of why it's not growing. So it's a little bit like, I think of it as a broken computer. And if you don't know, you know where to start, you know that one element in the computer is missing, but the computer is not working. Uh, doing diagnostic could be very challenging and so on. And, and this is all with the situation we face when you build a flux balance model and it's not working, it's very challenging to find out why. And of course, there are methods for doing this. You can look at pathway by pathway. Uh, but the idea uh, that David started thinking about is that um, one could uh, think of the problem of biomass production as a percolation problem, where metabolites that are present in the environment could be present and um, chosen with a certain probability. And then you can ask about the probability of producing a given metabolite. And you can ask this for any metabolite that is part of the biomass of an, of an organism and uh, systematically choose uh, many, many different random environments based on these probabilities and ask what is the chance that by giving as inputs these different metabolites, I'll be able to produce one of these biomass components. And the advantage of this is that um, even if the network has some holes, you'll occasionally add some of these metabolites by chance, and you'll get an overall picture of how producible a metabolite is um, given all these different uh, chances of different metabolites from the environment uh, being available. And this is illustrating, for example, how much more robust this algorithm is regular, uh, uh, relative to regular FBA. So for example, if you remove uh, randomly reactions from a network um, um, with the, you know, the fraction being, let's say, 1 in 100 or 1 in 10, um, FBA will soon uh, not be able to give you really accurate prediction of uh, the growth rate, but the producibility will tell you whether or not an organism can grow even after you remove a pretty large number of reactions from the network. So it doesn't give you an accurate prediction of the growth rate, but it will tell you what is the producibility of each metabolite in the network in a way that is uh, very robust. And I'll illustrate one of the applications of this. Uh, this was done again, uh, you know, circling back to the human oral microbiome. Um, and I'm showing here just a big uh, heat map of 456 strains from the human oral microbiome and 88 metabolites that are part of their biomass. And um, the darkness of the red shade here indicates how uh, producible each metabolite was for each of these strains. So uh, this uh, is a, basically a map of the metabolic capabilities of all these different organisms uh, based on this percolation algorithm. And I'll, uh, there is a lot of information here that could be compared then to, for example, co-occurrence of different organisms in microbiomes, and we started doing this. But I want to illustrate one specific example that was quite interesting. One of these oral microbes is uh, what is called TM7. You can't really see it from here, but there is a set of organisms that are not, um, are uncultivated bacteria. So these are organisms that are, uh, cannot be grown in the lab on a, on, on a medium like E. coli and many other bacteria. They depend on something else that uh, is unknown and they can only be cultivated in, um, cooperate in uh, together with another organism, in this case, actinobacteria. And there is a lot of laborious work uh, at the Foresight and other places to find these partnerships. And there is also uh, very recent efforts that allow to sequence these TM7 organisms uh, through metagenomic sequencing or single cell sequencing, something that was unthinkable of a few years ago. But now we have the full genomes of this organism, so we could compute this producibility. And what we found analyzing the producibility and the capabilities of this TM7 
um, uncultivated bacteria and the host, the actinobacteria, we found putative metabolites that are complementary between these two. So for example, um, uh, the host, the actinobacteria could provide vitamins and amino acids to the TM7. And what is interesting is that there are cell wall components that could be exchanged potentially also from the TM7 to the host, producing a two-way interactions that gives rise to a lot of uh, testable predictions and that gave rise to uh, you know, some follow-up studies. But this is just to illustrate how one can expand these ideas of flux balance modeling beyond just computing the detail uh, growth rate and using it to start analyzing real complex microbiomes and their metabolic capabilities. And I think it's time to stop. I'll just hint to the fact that what we'll talk about Monday um, is about uh, how you extend, you know, go beyond this uh, um, compartmentalized model and look at dynamic flux balance modeling where you can start thinking of really uh, not just a more um, realistic way of how to model exchange between organisms, but this will, allow, this will allow us to look at the dynamics and also the spatial structure of communities and a lot more. So I'll stop here and uh, see if there is any question. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Uh, floor is open for questions. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, da Daniel. Yeah. Uh, so, so for for the example, uh, last example, I mean, uh, the cross fading between TM seven and the host. Uh, have you done, you know, try to uh, validate the findings here in in, in vitro? Um, so I haven't. This is, I mean, we're doing experiments, but this is well beyond the kind of capabilities we have. I think there are only a couple of labs that can do this kind of experiments because, and this is just really fascinating work that is being done for, for example, at the Forsyth Institute. But just being able to isolate these TM7 organs, which are very small together with the host is a whole mm -hmm. art in itself. Um, so there is, uh, I think, uh, listed here, there is some evidence from preliminary studies, uh, for example, uh, that there is gene expression studies where it's really, it was found that some of these, um, for example, n acetyl d is really implicated in gene expression of the host in co-cultivation with TM7. So uh, there, there are now a lot of uh, efforts to try and characterize some interactions. And, and I think it will be very interesting to see if now this is valid. So yeah, that, mm -hmm. is that we are not doing this, but it is being done and that there is a lot of interest. This TM7, are a fascinating, very big clade in the tree of life that has just starts being characterized. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's definitely very interesting to delineate uh, which is the metabolite uh, among all of this potential uh, cross-feeding metabolite is it, it, playing the, the key role uh, of the interaction. That, that would be really fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. There was a raised hand uh, by Miguel Rodriguez, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Miguel, I, I have a question about, uh, well, I, I don't know if it might be more relevant for the DFBA, but I, I will ask uh, anyway. So you, you explicitly model, you have been showing how to explicitly model syntrophy and uh, sharing some, some of these uh, metabolites. Um, but uh, is, is there a way to also explicitly model the fact that competition has a very strong attractor for one, one, dominate, one dominating uh, species? Yes, yes, and uh, absolutely. And as you hinted to, the answer is going to be dynamic FBA. In dynamic FBA, this comes very naturally, as we'll see, because um, you know, I can just hint to this, right? In dynamic FBA, do this stepwise approximation of the growth curve where you solve flux balance time by time, at each time point, you predict the growth rate and you know how much nutrient is being depleted. Um, so if you have multiple organisms in the same environment, this is a little bit like a consumer resource model uh, where you keep track of the nutrient extracellularly and each organism will try to use it in it, that's its own best capabilities, but they will all compete for the same nutrient and therefore competition will come as a very natural outcome of these simulations, which is why now basically most of what we do and I think Dynamic FBA is really the way to go for modeling communities. 
if I can, I don't see any raised hands. So if I can ask an, another uh, question, are, are these, uh, is there a way to explicitly model also uh, toxic byproducts in the, the accumulation? I don't know. Yeah. At which byproducts become toxic. Yeah, that's another very good question. The, the short answer is no. Uh, I mean, the you can think of right reactions if you block internal reactions and there is no way for a metabolite to go. This will give a an infeasible solution in FDA. So that is a little bit similar to toxicity, but not really. I mean, toxicity. If you think about this, is really about a metabolite having a very high concentration and starting to do stuff that it shouldn't be doing inside the cell. But by definition, then FBA, regular FBA, does not have any notion of concentration inside the cell. So we really cannot do that. Um, you know, th there are kind of, uh, you know, just hint to the fact that if you look at things like shadow prices that give you sensitivity of the biomass production rate to changes in the constraints and including the mass conservation constraints, you start having a notion of concentration inside the cell. You can do this also with thermodynamic flux balance models where you can put back the concentrations. So, so in principle, I think it will be possible to do this, but I think it's, we're not there yet. And I, I think it's a super important question. Uh, but the other thing I'll say is that even if you have the concentrations, you need to know somehow what compounds do to proteins, why they're toxic. So if you have knowledge in advance, you can model the uh, kind of rising of a toxicity in a certain situation. But whether we can predict the novel, the toxicity, I think that's even more challenging. And I think that's a beautiful question, but I don't think, that, I think that's really beyond FBA, it would require structural modeling or other approaches. I don't seem to see any further question. I, sorry, I have a oh, question, yeah, but I cannot, I cannot find the, the thing to raise. To raise my hand. No um, uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, my question is to be related to what um, was asked before, and I, I wanted to ask, like, um, if I understood well, in this, um, in the, in the balance analysis, like you use uh, genomic data, like so already sequenced uh, organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was wondering just if this could be applicable to uh, non-cultivated uh, organisms, but um, let's say if this, if it would be too much of a stretch to apply this to max or to uh, differently sequenced uh, organisms. I'm thinking of the unculturable uh, extre extreme environments, mac yes. macrobial communities. Yes, yes, beautiful question. I think, you know, again, the answer until a few years ago was no. Um, because all of these FBA models really are based on a knowledge of the genome. And without that, you know, there, there may be other ways to phenotypic characterization, but I don't think, I think you really need the genome. But what is amazing now is that with the new technology of single cell sequencing, right? We, we can se sequence a single cell. Uh, and I think that starts being possible with, with the bacteria. But the other thing that I think will really change this dramatically, and there are some beautiful examples already out there, is that from uh, deep metagenomic sequencing, yeah. now you can get enough resolution to close individual genomes. So even you know, in, in a metagenome, if you have an organism that is uncultivated, you may have enough information to determine its, its genome. So I think that will open up uh, huge possibilities in terms of looking at this unculturable through flux balance. Model. Yeah, I was, and I, um, I was thinking perhaps help guiding like the, the, the culturability of these organisms. Right, right. Yeah. I think that would be absolutely fascinating. Again, you know, this is what we were trying to do here. Uh, the problem, I just want to put a caveat there, is that we, we know nothing about this unculturabilities, right? And, yeah. and there are many different hypotheses. If metabolites is what determines those, then yes, FDA can help. But there could be you know, signaling molecules, uh, protein factors, um, you know, all sort of other things that are beyond FDA. And if those, you know, for those cases, FDA okay. will not be able to say much. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I have a related question, Daniel. 
So you, you mentioned sorry, about sorry, the... Uh, sorry, there's a, there's a question from Martina. Oh, okay. We'll raise the hand and then... No, we'll but it's okay. You. I mean, it's okay. If it's related, I can wait. No problem. Okay, please go ahead. Then. Yeah, so me, can, can I ask or I... Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Martina. Yeah, so... so so I, yeah, my question is about the uh, reconstructing model. I mean, which is related to the previous question about the uh, reconstructing model from metagenomics. I, I mean, uh, even if the, we, we can't identify the, uh, the genomes, the specific genome from the metagenomics, is that possible or is there any work um, to you know, reconstruct uh, the model from the metagenome you know, by using a, you know, uh, the conception of, of a superbug? You know, not compartmentalized. You know, we, we, we probably don't have the enough information about uh, the genome of each bacteria in the metagenome, but it's possible to construct a, a superbug like model, you know, from the metagenome. Is that possible? Yeah. yeah Thank yeah. you. So, yeah, very, great question. The, um, it is possible, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this next time. Um, we, there, there are some approaches that essentially do a little bit of that. Um, but it's not clear to me that I think, yeah, it's not clear to me that they, that you, you really miss something and destroy something. So I'll tell you very briefly, one analysis we did a few years ago was looking at the yeast that has compartments and we compared FBA of yeast with compartments to an FBA of yeast where you destroy all the compartments. So it's a little bit like a simulation of exactly what you said, where you decompartmentalize the model. And what we found is that the decompartmentalized yeast um, you make a lot of mistakes in the predictions, basically because anything that depends on energy production across the membrane, oxidative phosphorylation doesn't work anymore. So I think it might be possible still to do ecosystem flux balance models. I don't know that anybody has actually done this, uh, but it could be possible if you keep track maybe also of meta compartments. But there are other approaches, network expansion based, which we'll talk about that actually do a little bit of that. So the answer is that it's not clear. It's a very interesting area, and more to come on this. Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. Please, Martina. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is: so, for example, uh, I don't know, pH and temperature can change uh, uh, the availability of the byproducts. These kind of things. Is it possible to integrate uh, these things in the flux balance analysis? The dynamic one. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. it's a it's a very good question. The the it's hard. I mean, it's not technically it's not impossible. I think there is there has been a little bit of work out there on temperature. Um, I mean, the tricky part of temperature is that it changes so many things, right? You could, in principle, try to put the some constraints on um, right the rate of reaction based on the Arrhenius equation and try to figure out some way of putting the, the temperature in there. But, but you know, if you think about this, there is denaturation of proteins or you know, suboptimal. So there's so many things that could be happening. And I think it, will, it would be very difficult. It's, it's a very painful thing for me because I, and many others, I think, because it, there is a lot of important applications uh, of how microcommunities will change with temperature, for example, climate change and so on. But unfortunately, I don't think there is a very effective way of incorporating temperature. And similar for pH, uh, we actually we had did some work, uh, which is unpublished, but on trying to simulate exactly what are the molecules that are being secreted and how this will induce changes in pH in the medium. So this is in principle possible, but, but it, it's very complicated. And uh, one of the things is that, let's say, proton exchange and so on is very hard to keep track of. Um, so I think for pH, there is hope. For temperature, is much harder. I would love, you know, if anybody had ideas of how to do this, I think that would be hugely important. But so far, I think, we, you know, we, it's, it's not been possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. I think we had a very lively and interactive uh, uh, lecture uh, with Daniel. Uh, I think more to come uh, uh, over the next days. Um, and so thanks, thanks again, Daniel. And thank you, thank you everyone. And we'll basically move directly to the next uh, lecture by Mercedes Pascual.
Mercedes, I think you're here already. <laughs>